like to welcome you to this memorial service celebrating the life of Kim L. Jensen. I'm Jeff Kingsolver. I'm his son-in-law. Sorry, I'm emotional, but um, we would like to thank Kirsten Bean and Kayla Jensen for uh, being the pianist and chorister today and thank all of you for coming, making the effort that it uh, took to, to come here today to honor this great man. Um, we will begin um, with the opening hymn, Be Still My Soul, number 124, after which Whitney Kingsolver, um, one of Kim's granddaughters, will give the opening prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this day that we can be here together. We're grateful for our family and, and our friends. We're grateful for the gospel, and we're grateful for the knowledge that we have of the plan of salvation. We're so grateful for our father, grandfather, friend, Kim Jensen. Please help us to feel the spirit today. Please help us to feel comforted and feel of thy love. Please help us to remember the life of Kim Jensen and please help us to be in tune with the spirit so that we know the messages that we need to receive. We're so grateful for the love that we have. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Whitney. Um, we'll now uh, have Wayne Jensen, Kim's brother, give the life sketch. After that, Jeffrey Jensen, Kim's son, will speak to us. And then we'll have a musical number, My Will I Give to Thee, which is a song, the lyrics that Kim wrote. Um, Amy Jensen will sing, and Melissa King Silver, both uh, the daughters of Kim, will, um, she, Melissa will accompany. And then we'll hear from David Jensen, Kim's son. I think it was just fine until we sung, sing. That's hard. <clears throat> Kim L. Jensen, 77, loving husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, completed his journey on earth on February 9th, 2022, surrounded by his family. He was an exemplary man of faith and service to his family, his fellow man, his country, and his God. Kim was born September 14th, 1944 in Rexburg, Idaho, to Loy Mon and Mona Marie Kepler Jensen. Growing up in Rexburg and then Driggs, Idaho, he enjoyed riding horses in the Teton Mountains in the summer in the winter, he convinced the same horses to pull, pull him on sleds and saucers. He graduated from Weezer High School in 1962, where he played the clarinet in the marching band. One of his favorite memories was receiving the National Finalist Band Award in the Music Man Marching Band Competition Festival in Iowa in 1962. He continued his education in business at Ricks College and Brigham Young University where he graduated with his bachelor's degree in 1969. He served faithfully as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Florida Mission, an area which, he, which held a special place in his heart for the rest of his life. <coughs> Excuse me. Kim married the love of his life, Patsy Ray Hall, on July 19, 1968, in the Idaho Falls LDS Temple. She has been the light of his life, and seeing to her comfort has been his greatest priority for the last 54 years. Kim proudly fulfilled his duty to his country and served honorably with the Army in Vietnam. Upon his return, he began his 35-year career at First Security Bank, and he continued his financial education at the Pacific Coast Banking School. His strong work ethic earned him frequent promotions, and he completed his career as a senior vice president with Wells Fargo Bank. Kim and Patsy were blessed with five children and their lives were filled with joy as they focused on simple pleasures, wonderful vacations to Yellowstone National Park, California, and a three week road trip across the entire country made for many special memories. Kim is a devoted disciple of Jesus Christ and served in many callings throughout his life. After retiring from banking in 2006, Kim served a second mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with his sweetheart, Patsy, when they were called to serve in the West Jordan Employment Resources Mission. They enjoyed it so much they served an extra year beyond their original calling and delighted in helping people improve their financial circumstances. He frequently commented how much he loved his companion on this mission. Later in life, Kim felt the limiting effects of Parkinson's disease, and it became necessary for him and Patsy to move to Covington Senior Living in Orem. 
The illness did not dampen his zest for life, and he became a champion at wee bowling. I can attest to that. He beat me very soundly. <laughs> Made many new friends and continued his lifelong pattern of service by volunteering within the facility. As a family, we are deeply grateful to all who cared for him and were part of his Covington family. Kim is survived by his wife, Patsy, <clears throat> his children, Jeffrey Jensen, Melissa Kingsolver, David Jensen, Amy Jensen, 24 grandchildren, and four, soon to be six, great-grandchildren. He was preceded in death by his parents, daughter Christine Hogan, and his sister Julia Baxter. Excuse me. Uh, the interment will be in the Orem City C Cemetery immediately following this service. Um, the words I've read show what a great person Kim was and is, but maybe doesn't include too much that uh, really brings out his fun-loving personality. So I was asked to take a few minutes and share some personal insights into what it was like to grow up with Kim as my elder brother. Um, the bottom line is it was an adventure. <coughs> Our father was an avid horseman, and so when we lived in drags, we spent a lot of time uh, trail riding in the Teton Mountains, and my father sometimes even acted as a tour guide for, to some spots that are unknown to most people. <coughs> Excuse me. Those trips are not to be forgotten, as, especially as my father passed away uh, a few years, just a few years past, uh, beyond that time. Uh, Kim was mostly nice to me during those trips, but there were times when I followed his lead a little bit too blindly. My first experience was with football was when he decided to teach me about the game, and I was 9 or 10 at the time. He was 15 or 16. He would toss me the football and say, run. <laughs> and then I would proceed to get wiped out. <coughs> it wasn't much of a contest, but I did learn how to take a hit. Um, there's another one of our activities in Driggs that has become sort of legendary, but more recently, I believe, um, we would lie on our backs on the grass in a park nearby, and with a bow and arrow, we would shoot, the, the goal was to shoot straight up. Well, that, that's great, and as you can imagine, if you're really good at that, it becomes exciting real quick <laughs> as the arrow hopefully comes down pretty straight. And uh, uh, no one, as I recall, ever suffered any real damage, but it was pretty exciting. <coughs> Um, I understand that uh, Kim and Patsy's children weren't told about this until they were well beyond the years where they had the wisdom not to try it. <coughs> uh, there were some other sketchy activities I followed him into in those years. and The last one I remember was in Weezer. He was a senior in high school there. He played in the pep band, and um, so for football games, he kind of had the privilege of driving into an area <coughs> past the entrance. Um, and uh, one time he decided he, did, he invited me to go along. And I'm not sure why, but he told me to lie down in the back, on the floor of the back of the car. He covered me with a blanket and we rode in, I guess, to avoid admission. Uh, he may have been just playing a joke on me. I don't know, but uh, I got to see a free game. Following his mission and during the time he was attending Ricks College, our Uncle Stanley was a bachelor at the time, and <clears throat> he always had the fancy sports cars. And he would blow into town in Rexburg and hand the keys to Kim. And so he had the... He was able to drive these uh, really cool cars for a night. And I would hear about it the next day. 
the, his ex, his uh, exploits, making sure that he was noticed, and uh, I think it was a good part of his uh, dating experience. Or the, I, I don't know if they had any effect on Patsy at the time, but it may have. Uh, in later years, many thought that Kim and I looked alike. <coughs> There were many times at extended family reunions where people would mistake one of us for the other one. And once during the family's visit to us in San Diego, I was serving as bishop at the time, and as Kim was there, uh, some of the members of our ward handed him their tithing <laughs> envelopes. <coughs> he very graciously took them, and we made him, we made him give them back. <laughs> <clears throat> the the best example of following Kim was in my young adult years. He and Patsy were married when I was a junior in high school. So by the time it was time for me to start looking around, uh, uh, they had had uh, Jeffrey and Melissa had been born by that point. They were so cute. So decided that was a pretty good match. So I proposed marriage to Patsy's sister, and uh, thankfully she went along with it. So we kind of have a double connection there, which we've enjoyed many times through the years. And our children have uh, really enjoyed that association as well. He was a special uncle to them. I can't tell you how many times they asked me why I wasn't as fun as their Uncle Kim. <laughs> So following in his footsteps has been one of the best things I could do. I have no regrets. And I look forward to being able to do that again. As I know, he's still engaged in great work and having a great time doing it. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I walk up here bringing his briefcase that he took to work for a few decades, um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to, it just somehow felt fitting to bring my comments on my piece of paper in his briefcase today and uh, have him be part of us, with us, and so I'm grateful for some of those little reminders at times. Um, thank you, Lane, for your comments there, and um, our family has enjoyed the, that double relationship very much as well. Uh, I hadn't written this down until you mentioned the cars, but uh, I'll, I'll just build on that for just a minute. He, he has a story that he told me when, we, when I started dating, and he said this is an example of what, uh, he would always say this is what you should not do, small bear, because of the Berenstein Bears, the book about don't do the, the things that the, 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 bear said, the bear father always said. And he said don't do this, but uh, he borrowed, I thought it was his grandpa's Rambler, but I'm not sure who exactly the Rambler belonged to but he borrowed it to take a girl on a, on a date to a drive-in movie. And they went to the drive-in movie, and when he pulled up there, he wanted to get comfortable, and so she was sitting on that side of the seat, and he was on this side. It was a long bench seat, as I understand it. And then he pulled the lever to slide the seat back, but mistakenly pulled the lever that folded the seat down into a bed. <laughs> <laughs> and he was very shocked, he says, and he had the big white eyes as he looked over, and his date had even bigger whiter eyes, and she was glued to the door. <laughs> And that was the last time he ever dated that girl. <laughs> but um, anyway, he, he has, a, he, it probably was an adventure for growing up with uh, some of his antics. <laughs> but um, he did have a zest for life. And I hope that that's something that comes out in our, our comments today. Uh, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm couching my comments today about things that we can learn and that I've learned personally uh, from, from my dad. And the first thing I wanted to comment is how he tried to not take things too seriously in life and, uh, and learn to laugh at things. He was not perfect, and he was free to confess that, but uh, he did try and learn. But um, there are a lot of fun things that he uh, has, I mean, you shared some of them right there, but uh, if you want to hear some fun stories from later on, you'll have to corner David, because they've had a long-running string of practical jokes that they've escalated to the point where it got the point of carrying power tools up an elevator in a downtown apartment in Salt Lake after having some adventures together, and we'll leave that story to him to tell. But uh, 
uh, that he ha does have a zest for life. And you saw in the video earlier some of the costumes that he wore that he and mom would dress up for going to uh, uh, bank events. And you saw him dressed up in a, in a policeman costume, but another time they dressed in a costume where they, were, they had to create casts for themselves. They always liked to, to have fun and, and do things out of what people would expect in order to put a f smile on their face. But throughout it all, even when he was in Vietnam, you saw this in the pictures, that he's got a smile on his face. He's uh, thousands of miles away from his family in a difficult situation, and yet he's got a smile on his face. He's carrying optimism and enthusiasm in his heart and, uh, and courage, and, and I appreciated that. And even though in his later years with his illness, that's been difficult for him to maintain that, still even as recent as a month ago when I called him on the phone, he would answer it, hello, hello. <laughs> And it's a curious thing that I don't know if he said that to everybody or just me. I don't know. But it always felt very personal, and, and I always appreciated that enthusiasm that came through from that, that um, enthusiastic and lilting hero <laughs> when I called him up. And, uh, but there is one story that it took him a long time to get over. That what, To us, it was, it was a great laugh, but he found it took him years to find the laughter in this one. Uh, but as many of you probably know, he, he dealt with ulcers for a long period of time in his career. And the stomach ulcers were, were very painful to him. So he was perennially attached to a bottle of Mylanta. And um, the, this Mylanta went everywhere with him. And he would always shake it up and then just drink straight out of the bottle. No don't bother with measuring it or anything. And one day we were driving in our Buick. And he asked Melissa to hand him the Mylanta from the back seat. So she was trying to help be, we're, this is when we kind of were aware of the responsibilities of driving, and so she was trying to help him stay concentrating on the road, I think. But she shook it up for him and took the lid off and handed it to him and said, Dad, I took the lid off for you. And he promptly took it, put his finger over the top, and just shook it vigorously and sprayed Mylanta <laughs> all over the inside of the car. It just coated everything in pink, pink uh, Mylanta. And so we, in the back seat, thought that was hilarious, and we were laughing as hard as we had in a while. But Dad did not see the humor in that, and uh, it took him many years before he was willing to see the laughter in that. <laughs> Eventually he did come around, but it was after we sold the car and stopped scraping pink stuff out of the cracks and crevices of the dashboard. <laughs> um, but uh, he was someone who loved to laugh, and we've, we've laughed a lot with him over the years. As you can tell also, there's a love of outdoors, starting with those horse trips in the Tetons. Um, we've spent a lot of time camping with our family. That's what we did often for vacations. Yellowstone Park became an annual pilgrimage for us uh, as vacation time, and we had so many memories there that uh, are still treasures today. But I thought it was very interesting that uh, be starting from being on a horse in those early years, one of the last times he went into the mountains for camping was also again on a horse when he was in the state presidency of the West Jordan whatever the well-be stake is, and um, uh, was a, a part of the leadership group for a Pioneer Trek. And he got to ride a horse. After all those years, instead of being a youth, now he was leading with the youth as part of that building that he does of trying to help uh, grow and develop and build other people. Here he was doing it again um, on a horseback again. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about his music experience, too. As you know, he was big into music. We've got some of the lesser, more obscure instruments that he loved was a nose flute, and uh, uh, we have, he had a mouth harp that he liked to play with as well. Uh, the slide whistle, he, <laughs> that was a treasured gift when we got a new slide whistle a few years ago for Christmas that he remembered having earlier, and getting a new one was his favorite Christmas present. But uh, he also played the clarinet, and uh, that was something he shared with me. I, I did marching band, and we went to a competition in Oregon when I was in high school and did well. And I thought we were really something. And then I was talking with him about it, and he told me about the, the routines that they did from Weezer High School. And we couldn't even envision how complicated those routines were he did in Weezer. But they were astounding, the things that they did in their routines. And that's part of the reason why they went to Iowa and and got that award in 1962. It was a big deal, and, and if you search even now, 1962, Music Man, Weezer High School, there's still articles on the internet that have been put there from people who scanned in newspaper articles about it. That was a big event for him that he had a lot of fun with, and if you read through his diary of that experience, then he had some fun. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but he continued his musical career. And uh, in, in college, this is something that maybe not too many people know, I don't know. But uh, he was performing at Rick's College at a student body assembly. And it was a song in French, and he doesn't speak French, but he'd memorized the words and was singing this song. And as this song got started, he blanked and lost the words. And so he didn't know what the words were. And so he improvised and just started making up French-sounding words to the song. And so he got done with the song, and people applauded, and he sat down. And, and afterwards, someone came up and said, I served my mission in France, but I didn't recognize that language. Where did you serve in France? And Dad just calmly said, it's a very obscure dialect. Not many people know it. <laughs> and he's like, oh, that's great. Well, good job. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so he was a performer. He knew how to handle an audience. <laughs> but um, that was fun. He, he continued with music even into uh, later years. He, was, he served, uh, served uh, played in the Magic Valley Symphony when we lived in Burley and performed in that community uh, symphony several times. But then one of the highlights of his uh, musical career, I guess, is that it meant a great deal to him when the Boise Temple was dedicated he was able to sing in the choir while my mom was the accompanist singing Hark All Ye Nations in the Boise Temple for one of the dedicatory services uh, with President Hinckley, I believe, presiding at the time. And that meant a great deal to him. He was very excited for that chance to sing in the presence of a prophet in the temple uh, at a, a facility, a building that he loved. And uh, so that was really special. And then later, as was mentioned earlier, he participated with Brother Pace, who was here earlier today, came to visit. Uh, they had to go elsewhere, but they're going to watch this replay uh, at a later time. But he and Dad collaborated on creating a hymn that they did submit to the church for potential inclusion in a future hymn book. It was not approved, but it is published now on Amazon, so you can go buy your own copy if you want. Uh, but anyway, they did uh, collaborate on creating this hymn that meant a great deal to Dad and sharing his testimony through song which he had done so many times, and uh, now was a chance to commit it to a longer term uh, form. And so we're going to get to hear Amy sing that uh, with Melissa accompanying in a few minutes, and that will be a special for us to hear Dad's voice speaking to us even now and sharing his feelings about the gospel and about his Savior, who we all are so appreciative of. Um, one more comment here about uh, his uh, some of the strange, quirky things about him was on his mission. Uh, that One of the pictures in the slideshow was of a, a house on a bayou-looking thing. And that was his mission apartment that he lived in. And they had run out of money at the time and didn't have any food to eat. So they found, they scraped the last little piece of peanut butter out of their jar and, and put it on a metal hook that they found in, downstairs on, on a string and dropped it out the back and they caught a turtle. And so they didn't know what to do next, so they improvised just like you did with the French words, I guess, I don't know. Uh, but they found some pruning shears and they carved the turtle open and harvested what looked like meat and made a soup. And they ate their soup. And then the, the, his companion's family didn't believe the story, so he mailed the shell home to them to prove it. <laughs> and then uh, the, the rest of the story is kind of interesting because mom was visiting teaching a family in Burley when we lived there, 25 years later or so and shared that story about how the Lord provides for his servants when they're on his errand. And the, the woman said, when was your husband on his mission? And she replied, and uh, whenever it was, and she said, one moment. She disappeared for a minute and came down from upstairs bringing a turtle shell. And that was that companion's mom. And so after all these years, the, 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 the story came full circle of getting to reconnect with his companion through his companion's mom. And, and sure enough, that myth that we always kind of wondered about was true. <laughs> so that was pretty fun. I want to cross over now to a little bit of his leadership experience and some of the experiences that um, has influenced me in my life I, I, and uh, things that I've talked with him often about. He always asked me, how's my career doing? How's my job? That was a, an important thing to him to provide for his family. And he asked me all the time, how am I doing at it? But uh, he, well, I asked him once, where did you learn to be a manager and, and lead these big groups of people? Because he, he did pretty well with the bank um, and their leadership growth there. And he said, I've learned everything I needed to know about leadership from my church service. And I thought, really? That's weird because you're teaching people seven, habit, seven habits of highly effective people and things. 
But he said, no, everything I needed to know I learned through church service. And I've, I've come to see it through a different lens as a result of him having that conversation with me. And so I wanted to just hit a couple of points here about the kind of leader that he was. Both and it applies both ways. One thing is his teaching. He, he loved to teach people and, and in his role in the bank, one of the most uh, prolific things he did was teach and train people. Over the course of his career, we added it up, he directly mentored or supervised or trained over a thousand people that he had direct responsibility for teaching them. And over a course of 33 years, that's, 30, that's 8,000 days. So on average, every eight days in his career, he was starting, a, if you just spread it out evenly, it would be every eight days he's training somebody new in his group, which is pretty astounding streak when you think about it. But it's a lot of new people to be sharing and teaching and training over the course of a 33, 33 years. But the gospel is all about teaching as well. We talk about in the gospel being anxiously engaged about doing things that are new or different and trying to be anxiously engaged in doing things that need done. And one of the things he did in his career was pioneer in-store bank branches in grocery stores. That was a new idea at the time, and he was one who helped implement that and, and prototype it for, for security and, and roll that out eventually. Now we can't hardly go to a grocery store without seeing a bank in the front of it, right? But he helped pioneer that concept. He knows the one. We talk often about knowing the one, but that was an important way that he did his leadership at the bank. And he would ask us kids when he was taking a new role, he'd give us a sheet that has names and pictures and we'd have to drill him on it so he could memorize all the names and the, and the photos so that when he went into a meeting, he knew who he was talking with. And he knew them by name and by their face. And we would, we would help him practice that as a way of getting to know, really know the people that he, he needed to lead. He served with them and he suffered with them. He worked through cancer, uh, people who were dealing with cancer on his staff and was there for them in their hour of need. And he suffered with them, with people who uh, violated the rules and stole money from the bank and he had to take them through trials and go to court with them and, and uh, watch them struggle with the impacts of their decisions. Those were not easy things, but uh, he was there at their side doing the best he could to help them along the way. And in the end, the trust that he gained in his role at the bank was significant. And at one point when he was the area manager in Idaho Falls, the success of his teaching and his training had led that the, area ma the Idaho Falls area to grow to a such an extent that his, his area that he was responsible for had uh, over a billion dollars worth of loans and deposits, which was more than 5% of the entire corporation just on his shoulders. So he had a successful career there through employing these principles that he learned through the gospel. But that service wasn't just in the bank or through his local ward. He did a lot of community service as well through the Rotary Club and Chamber of Commerce. He was the president of three different Rotary Clubs and a couple of Chamber of Commerces and, uh, and participated in others. But here's, this was a funny story that probably not many people know besides the helping with fish fries and pancake breakfasts and things. He felt really acutely that role of community service and making the community a better and safer place. And so when we lived in American Falls, he felt that there was a need for the merchants and the local stores to be more careful with their goods to uh, take care of their stores security-wise. And so preparing for a presentation he was giving to the local merchants, he told, told them that he was going to talk about shoplifting and about uh, doing a better job of being careful with your inventory and, and protecting from theft. He coordinated with the police and then he hired a band of what he called a band of hooligans from ISU, <laughs> the local college in Pocatello. He recruited them to come and shoplift for a day. And so he brought them in with police approval and they, he said, come and get whatever you can get this afternoon and we'll, we'll put it on display for your meetings tomorrow, for my meetings with the, these merchants tomorrow. They heisted all sorts of things. They had five foot high potted plants. They brought out racks of clothing with the racks underneath the clothing. <laughs> They brought out um, all sorts of different things. I can't remember the full list, but they, they boosted a lot of material. <laughs> and so he helped them arrange it the next day, and then the next day the merchants came in to see all of their goods just filling up a whole part of a room and then helped them see that they did, in fact, need to do a little more diligence in taking care of their, of their businesses. He, I, that, that was something that uh, he was 
I don't know how broadly that became known, but he was the, the, the guy behind the curtain that executed the biggest heist in American Falls history. <laughs> <laughs> With police approval. But in addition to the service in the community that way, he also taught service to me as a son in unique ways too. I got to be his home teaching companion from the day I was like seven years old, we were living in Salmon. He took me out on visits to people and we helped the people, we, everyone heated their houses with wood there and so we chopped wood and stacked wood and I had to go in and help him with places where the houses smelled really bad and I thought, how do you do this dad? I just sat there like this the whole time he was talking with them because the houses smelled strange to me. And but. Uh, he taught me uh, how to serve other people. And we even climbed up on people's roofs and shoveled the snow off the roof because it was so heavy and so deep that it needed to be removed from their roof so that the, the ladies who lived inside would be able to have a warm place to sleep. But one of the things that has stuck with me the most and has touched me most recently is the lesson that he taught me about how to use the priesthood. He's, it was a consistent theme to him to say, that the priesthood is intended to be used, don't let it go underutilized. And also, this, the corollary to this was that the priesthood, uh, service in general, uh, but in, in general service, in order for someone to be blessed by giving it, someone else has to be humble enough to receive it. And that was something that, I, I, it, that lesson came out of me talking with him once about why did, we, why did you let somebody do this? Because we could take care of it for ourselves. And he taught me that lesson, and it became a very powerful one to me to watch for both sides of service and be willing to receive as well as give. And I say that it touched me recently because last week after, after, um, after Dad left, uh, I was thinking and pondering on the things that I've learned from him, and I was sitting in my car on Sunday afternoon and just kind of thinking. I, I talked with people at church that day about... Uh, dad and and coming here for the, the funeral today and I was reflecting a little bit and I was thinking I felt fine I, I was like I'm, I'm comfortable I'm at peace with this and then I just had this thought hit me um, that don't let the priest to be underutilized Jeffrey and I thought well, okay I hear you dad <laughs> and so I thought you know I actually probably would enjoy having a priest of blessing right now that would be meaningful to me so I called up a good friend and uh, someone who knows me very well, an intimate uh, friend and associate of ours in Oregon, and just said, hey, would you be willing to give me a blessing? And he didn't know that my dad had passed away yet. I hadn't been sharing it very broadly yet. And so I went and met with him and just told him that I could use a priest of blessing. And he was happy to oblige. And the first thing he said after he put his hands on my head and pronounced Jeffrey Kim Jensen and started the blessing, and he said... Don't be afraid, and remember that service is something that in order for people to be blessed, somebody has to receive it. And I thought, Dad, you're not very far, are you? <laughs> you're right here. I'm hearing the lesson that you taught me so many times over those years. Even now, you're still teaching me. And I'm grateful for that. But I'm going to finish up with the thing that probably was the most profound impact on us, and that is that one day... Uh, when we were young, uh, on Monday morning before school, Dad walked into our bedrooms while we were just getting up and he was getting ready to go to work. He handed us a piece of paper that had three letters, FFA, on it. And uh, he said, we're going to talk about this in home evening tonight. So try and figure out what it means. Think of what this, these letters might mean. And so the whole day, we were trying to figure out what it might mean. We knew Future Farmers of America was a thing, but we didn't think he was trying to get us to be farmers because he's a banker. And I didn't know how to milk a cow for the life of me. And so <laughs> um, so we tried to come up with ideas. But that night when they rolled it out, it turns out that what it stood for was family first always. And that was the genesis of that. What became our family motto, I guess, is the best way to say it. And it became a consistent theme. And he, we talked about it that night. And he said, and the way that we'll use this to talk with each other about it is when I just hold up the finger, number one, that means not that we're number one, we're the best. That just means we're keeping our priorities first, family first, always. And so from then on, we'd be up in church giving a talk, and he'd be down in the audience, and he'd just kind of sneak us a number one while we were paying it, while we were looking at him. And I saw him do that the day I was called into my first bishopric. 
we saw him do that when we were blessing one of our children. And it was just a sign with him to say, I'm proud of you, and I'm, I'm glad you're keeping family first. And we'd get, we'd, it'd be written in our mission letters and birthday cards and things. And it was that theme that we always had. Every, it was very consistent with him. And so I'd like to invite you as brothers and sisters and all of us family in some way with Kim to just do with me. Just raise your finger and say, family first, Dad. You did it. Because that was the most important thing to him was our family. And not just the local family, but family in the sense of God as well. You know, we're brothers and sisters here on the earth to work together back to our Savior. And that meant a great deal to him. And so I'm grateful to you being here to celebrate his relationship of family with each of us today. And I say this uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you, Amy and Melissa. Well, when we were planning out this service, it actually began years ago when we were talking to mom and dad about their wishes and desires and everything. And, and dad said, keep it short and teach the gospel. Uh, he also said he didn't really want to travel long, so he can take that up with Jeffrey <laughs> later, I guess. So. But uh, it is my pleasure to share a few thoughts uh, on the pleasing gospel of Jesus Christ together with you today. So honestly, uh, I'd like to begin by sharing just a few, a few thoughts that came in quick succession once I, I heard that Dad had passed away. And the first thought I had was, Dad, congratulations. You did it. It's not easy to come into this life, and it's not easy all too many times to leave this life. And, uh, and he did it, and I'm proud of him, so proud. Hot on the heels of that came a vision to my mind's eye of Dad no longer being bent over with age, no longer shuffling with his walker, but being, you know, upright in posture and, and striding forward in strength and vitality uh, as he was engaged in a purposeful work of, of some sort. Uh, again, th- these are just quick, quick little flashes of, of thoughts that ran through my head. And uh, hot on the heels of that one, then came the thought that, you know what, he gets to see his daughter, Christine, again. And he gets to see his sister and brother-in-law. And he gets to see his mom. And then when I realized that uh, as this thought, uh, you know, progressed to its, uh, to its logical conclusion, he got to see his dad again. Now, uh, having to lose your dad when you're just 17, that's tough, man. That's hard. And so many of life's decisions and just so many things that, that you learn about being an adult and like, you know, taxes and insurance and, and just how to, how to live and how to have a career. I mean, these are things that, that it's nice to have a dad around for. And I'm sure grateful that I had a dad that could, that could help me navigate those things. But the first gospel principle that I'd like to share uh, that, that kind of hit home to me this past week was the power of faith. You know, so often in the church when we teach about faith, we do it in this sort of like abstract way. It's like this belief, you know, you believe in stuff and good things happen, right? And, and I'm doing it a disservice, right? But, and, and there is an element to, of just raw belief to faith, right? But there's also a significant, tangible, concrete blessings that flow into our lives as we live faithfully. And, uh, and I felt those this past week. I felt peace. And I felt comfort in real significant ways. Uh, Elder Ballard said, peace, real peace, whole souled and to the very core of our being comes only in and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is absolutely true. Uh, John chapter 14 has some incredible little, uh, little glimpses into what the Savior was doing as he was preparing to conclude his mortal journey. Uh, just, just incredible chapter of scripture in in John 14, but the Savior said this, yes to the disciples, but I think to us as well. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. And that's amazing to know that we won't be left comfortless. But the Savior doesn't stop there. He continues and he says, I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. It's amazing to me to contemplate uh, just the blessings of faithful living. It's astonishing. The Lord says he's not going to wait around for us to, like, you know, cry in our moment of need. He says, I will come to you. I will be right there with blessings in my hands and with healing in my wings when you need me. That is the true nature of the Savior, Jesus Christ. So a few weeks before Dad passed away, he was in the hospital for a couple of days, and I was able to, to spend much of that time with him. And we, we talked of many things. We reminisced, and, and we laughed, and, uh, and remembered. Uh, some of the things that surfaced in our conversations included uh, Grandma Jensen's carrot cake with caramel sauce. And I, I know it's right around lunchtime, and, but uh, many of you here in this room have enjoyed that particular blessing of mortality as well. But uh, at that time, I also saw the, the incredible change that had taken place in Dad physically. And Parkinson's disease is, that's a, that's a tough one, and that's hard. And uh, Parkinson's disease combined with age, uh, 
resulted in some significant deterioration. Even over just over the preceding month um, since I had, had been with him most recently. But yet I go back to my mind's eye, that vision of dad striding forward in strength and vitality and purpose. And uh, I contemplate that, that difference between, you know, the, the frailty of, of old age and, and the vigor of moving forward with purpose. And that's an incredible change. One day, uh, well, I, right now, dad's spirit, uh, of course, doesn't suffer from physical ailments. It, it doesn't suffer from pain or from hunger or from, from age or Parkinson's or any of those things. And one day, his, his perfect, strong spirit will take up this mortal body, and that mortal body will be transformed, absolutely transformed, into something that, that is worthy of the strength and vitality of his spirit. And that's an incredible transformation. But as I contemplate that change, I, I go back to, uh, to something I learned when I was teaching sunbeams in primary. And my own personal theory is that the closer you can get back to teaching sunbeams in primary, the better you're doing in the church, right? That, that's like the reward that we, we all, well, at least I seek for. But uh, around Easter time, there came up a lesson on teaching the Savior's atonement to a bunch of, like, four-year-olds. And I thought, how on earth am I going to, to share some, some thoughts about the atonement that can be, you know, comprehended in, in a four-year-old mind? And what I came up with is if you boil everything down, you boil it all down, you, 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 you condense it down to its absolute core, uh, the Savior's atonement is the power to change. It's the power to change. It's the power to change us. It's the power to change our hearts. It's the power to change our desires and, and, and who we are and our characters and even our very natures to the point that we can become something closer to what God already is, something closer to what he knows we can be. Honestly, I think it's no wonder that the Savior's first public miracle, the wedding at Cana, was, was to turn water into wine. Isn't this just a great synopsis of what the Savior's mortal purpose, and, and in fact eternal purpose, is all about? You take the very nature of one thing, and you change its chemical composition and transform it into something that's a completely different substance. Isn't that the Savior's atoning power in a nutshell, right there? And what's amazing, too, is... Uh, I think about what happens when we repent. When we repent, we don't really change ourselves. It, that's not really what the word repent means. To repent means to turn. It means to turn to God. That's all it means. When we repent, we're simply turning back to God. And when we do, it's the Savior's atoning power that swoops in, and that's what changes us. And that's what can result in true, lasting, eternal change. Um, it's amazing to me that that power of God, that atoning power of God that we talk about in context of repentance so often, but it, it's real in a physical sense as well, and it changes our, our mortal, bowed down with age state into something that is strong and godly. Uh, one little final point that I'd like to make is that, um, you know, on the surface, each of our lives may appear to be kind of a small thing. Um, you know, where, where Dad's body is not lying in state in some rotunda somewhere. Uh, flags aren't at half staff, and we're, there are no national headlines that I'm aware of that have are, are proclaiming Kim's passing. Um, and in fact, even if you look at each of our lives, we're we're all full of shortcomings and and just mortal stuff, right? Uh, President Uchtdorf talked about this in a talk that he gave a while ago, and um, uh, for, as part of the example, uh, I'd like to, to mention something called the Hubble Deep Field Experiment. Okay? So the Hubble Telescope, we're familiar with that. We've seen amazing pictures from, uh, from astronomers. And uh, I didn't know this, but the, the scientific director of the Hubble telescope, he has 10% of that, that telescope's time, which is in very high demand. But he has 10% of that time to do whatever he wants with, okay? They call it his discretionary time, so he can pursue whatever science activities he wants to. And so he and a group of astronomers got together, and they said, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's point the, the telescope um, out of the plane of the Milky Way to get rid of all the Milky Way light pollution. Let's pick a patch of sky that has very few stars. 
And in fact, what they did, if you take a pin and hold it at arm's length, and, uh, and, and the amount of sky that's covered by the head of the pin, uh, that's the amount of sky that they focused on, okay? And I did have to double check with Colleen, the head of the pin is the round part that you hold when you stick it in something, it's not the pointy bit, okay? But anyway, it's still not very big, right? You hold it up at arm's length, that's the amount of sky that they trained the Hubble telescope on, and they, they collected light for 10 days. And the result of that, as the pictures started to flow in, were astounding. They were amazing. In this patch of sky, in the, in the darkest section of sky that they could find, covered by the head of a pin held at arm's length, they found thousands upon thousands of not just stars, of not just solar systems, but entire galaxies, each galaxy with their billions and billions of stars. Imagine, that it, the, the scientists at the time said that uh, if they were to cover the entire sky with that same level of exposure, it would take them 900,000 years. And going back to President Uchtdorf's talk, he talks about how God had a conversation with Moses in Moses chapter 1, and God revealed to Moses some of the breadth of his creations. And that's what I imagine in my mind when I... When I um, when I read Moses 1, is that incredible view of thousands upon thousands of galaxies. And, and God knows them, and he knows his creations, and he, he knows each particle of his creations. And even in the midst of that incredible majesty and grandeur, God also knows us, and he knows me, and he knows Dad, and he knows you. And he cares so infinitely much about what you're doing in life. He cares what you think. And he cares, he cares what you do. He even cares what you eat and drink. This, this grand creator of all that is cares what you say and how you treat those around you. Uh, President Uchtdorf then quotes, uh, then President Uchtdorf then quotes uh, from Moses 1 verse 9. And the presence of God withdrew from Moses that his glory was not upon Moses. And Moses was left unto himself, and as he was left unto himself, he fell to the earth. And it came to pass that it was for the space of many hours before Moses did again receive his natural strength like unto a man. And he said unto himself, Now for this cause I know that man is nothing, which thing I never had supposed. You know, uh, seeing Moses fall to the earth, it reminds me of the Book of Mormon, right? It seems like every couple of chapters people are like falling down in, in astonishment or whatever. Uh, it's not because they're weak of constitution. It's not because they're frail uh, emotionally. It's because they're contemplating what Moses contemplated. The majesty of God, the creator of all, knows me and cares what I do. In section 18, uh, the Lord said, Remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Going back to President Uchtdorf's remarks, The Lord doesn't care at all if we spend our days working in marble halls or stable stalls. He knows where we are, no matter how humble our circumstances. He will use in his own way and for his holy purposes those who incline their hearts to him. God knows that some of the greatest souls who have ever lived are those who will never appear in the chronicles of history. They are the blessed, humble souls who emulate the Savior's example and spend the days of their lives doing good. I can't imagine a better description of, of dad than that. Uh, in his own way, I, I think that, uh, or in our own way, each of our lives is kind of like the lad who contributed five loaves and, and a few small fishes, right? And uh, the Savior can take the offering of our lives and he can turn it into a miracle. And he does. And he can turn it into a miracle of growth and of eternal development and of progression and eventually uh, achieving our, our true nature, fulfilling our true nature and destiny to rejoin with God because we are like him, because we think the same things that he thinks, and because we, we eventually become gods ourselves. Brothers and sisters, the, our actions in this life matter so very much. They really do. Uh, let us live in faith. Let us pursue humble, humble lives, doing good, serving others, and great are the rewards that will come. I say these things and share these thoughts with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you everyone who has participated in this service. Um, it's been wonderful. I just, I, I have to add my testimony. Um, amen to what David said and Jeffrey and Lane and um, seek Jesus Christ. If you wonder about what we've said, if it's true, find out. It is true. Kim lived a life that exemplified someone who lived the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I encourage anyone who is wondering about that to seek Jesus and to find that out for yourself. And I just bear testimony of the reality of the Savior Jesus Christ and of his plan for us. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will close um, singing hymn number 97, Lead Kindly Light, after which Niles Hogan, son-in-law, will give the closing prayer, and the dedication of the grave will be at the cemetery by Jeffrey Jensen. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to come here today to talk and about Kim Jensen and the influence he's had on our lives. We're grateful for his testimony and of the gospel that, that he shared in small ways with all, all of us. We're grateful for the peace that we have felt here and ask for thy blessings to be upon us. 
We're grateful for the plan of salvation that gives us the hope and the faith in thy son. In the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen. Can we have the congregation stand, please, and the pallbearers come forward? Thank you. 